Have you noticed how high gas prices are these days? The regular gas retail price is averaging about $3.21 right now. That's $1 more per gallon than a year ago. In fact, this is a seven year high in the United States. This is mainly because the price of Brent crude oil has been at an all time high since 2014. This September, it averaged $74 a barrel. Compare that to last September, which was $34. So you can see it more than doubled. And the current high price probably won't be the limit. And let's believe it'll average $81 for the rest of the year. But it's not impossible to see crude oil prices reach $100 a barrel in the near future. Actually, the market is actively buying options for $100 a barrel for 2022. And some buyers are shelling out $200 per barrel for this December. Overall experts believe this trend is due to low production, supply disruption, and increased demand. But there's yet another reason it's happening behind the scenes. Let's talk about low production. Simply put, right now, not much oil is being produced in the world. Many doubt production will be restored next year to the pre-pandemic level. At the same time, we have a global energy crisis with the sharp rise in gas and coal prices. As energy demands grow, the low production won't be able to meet the demand, which means prices continue to rise. So how did this happen? In the spring of 2020, oil prices plummeted due to the pandemic. Remember, airplanes were grounded, cities were under lockdown, and there was an enormous drop in fuel demand. That's why the the oil supply at that time was 20% higher than the demand. Needless to say, members of OPEC agreed to reduce their oil production by a record amount, almost 10 million barrels per day, which is about 10% of world production. This was the OPEC plus deal. The US and other countries that aren't normally part of OPEC also cut production. So all in all, this meant a reduction of some 15 million barrels per day, or more than 15% of the world's oil production. Prices quickly rose to 40 to $45 per barrel. Exporters suffered Offered huge losses even at relatively high prices. That's because the cut in production cost them tens of billions of dollars. The first tough pandemic lockdowns helped the global economy to start recovering. So exporters started to increase production again. They were cautious. They didn't want to restore production fully or too quickly. Otherwise, that would bring a drop in price. The pandemic is still ongoing and if any country with a large economy, let's say China for example, were to enforce yet another new lockdown, that would mean demand will plummet again. So you can see how the situation has been quite volatile. Initially, analysts thought that even a slow increase in production by the OPEC members would make supply exceed demand for January 2022, and therefore lead to a drop in prices. They believe this because U.S. companies increased offshore oil production to pre-pandemic levels a few months ago. Before the pandemic, the U.S. production level led to an oil surplus on the world market. But this initial forecast of an excess of supply turned out to be wrong. This summer, it became clear that a huge additional demand for oil could emerge in the world in the upcoming months. For the first time in decades, the price of natural gas in Europe and Asia exceeded the price of oil in terms of energy release. So that's why analysts believe they'll see significant increase in oil demand from 750,000 to 2 million barrels per day. This summer, it also became evident that most of the OPEC plus members couldn't increase production even to the quotas that they'd agreed upon. At the same time, oil demand was growing much faster than previously forecasted. In September 2021, the OPEC plus members increased production faster than they initially agreed to, but they still couldn't keep up with the demand. Only Russia and Iraq are producing more oil than their quotas allow. The problem is, many of the oil exporting countries don't have enough investment to return to previous production levels. OPEC leadership denies this, of course. Some people speculate that maybe they're just not reinvesting in oil production at pre-pandemic levels since the global economy is transitioning to green energy. They point to the fact that even the largest private oil companies in the world have been investing in renewable energy in addition to future oil expansion. Recently, British Petroleum has been gambling big on a fast transition from oil to renewables. That's because all major oil players are facing lots of pressure from government regulators and investors to develop cleaner energy and divest from fossil fuels since it's the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming. So BP has been gambling to transition faster than its peers. BP proposed to cut oil production by 40% or about a million barrels a day. That's equal to the United Kingdom's entire daily output in 2019. In addition, BP is boosting capacity to generate electricity from renewable resources equivalent to the power made by 50 U.S. nuclear plants. Going back to rising gasoline prices, some people speculate that some oil exporting countries aren't 
are quick to return to previous investment level in new oil production projects because of green energy. They say the current oil situation is an opportunity to transition more quickly to green energy and abandoned oil. But unfortunately, it's not all that simple. The chief planner of the International Energy Agency, which is responsible for green energy transition, said that the transition could become quite messy. The IEA's new version of the energy transition plan shows a noble yet ambitious goal to achieve zero greenhouse gas by 2050. This will limit climate change to 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. They believe that only the speed of transition will allow avoiding catastrophic consequences for the climate, population, and economy. Let's talk about electrification. A few years ago, Stanford economists projected that EVs will kill the global oil industry by 2030. If the world economy really starts abandoning fossil fuels at the speed that politicians are planning, then some people think we'll reach the peak of oil consumption sooner than later, which after that point, oil demand will only go down. Would it surprise you to hear that gas giants BP and Shell acquired EV charging companies? They bought them with chump change to diversify their holdings. But it just goes to show that the oil industry acknowledges the electric future. But the fact is that it'll probably take a bit longer than that before the EV uptake destroys oil demand. Frankly, EVs have a way to go before it can challenge the internal combustion engine industry and subsequently the oil industry to a significant degree. Here's why. Last year, light plug-in and fuel cell cars plus electric city buses and two wheelers displaced some 370,000 barrels per day. Expert estimate that number will grow to 1.5 million barrels per day by 2025. That's 400%. You might think that sounds like an insane a huge number. The fact is, that would be just 1.4% of the world's total oil demand. So it's just a tiny dent. And that's why oil investors aren't losing sleep over it yet. Here's another interesting metric. Last year, just 2.7% of cars sold their EVs. Experts believe it'll grow to 31% by 2040. So the EV has an upward trend, and its long-term outlook is bright. But nevertheless, it's still decades away. If governments want to accelerate the EV revolution, they need to create more incentives for consumers to buy EVs and create more subsidies to speed up the infrastructure growth and battery innovations. Recently, Biden administration has proposed investing heavily on EV infrastructure. The UK previously had plans to ban sales of gasoline and diesel cars after 2040. But last year, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced they're moving up the deadline to 2030. Just consider what major car companies are doing right now. General Motors pledged to focus on electric cars and be fully electric by 2035. Jaguar plans for their cars to be fully battery electric by 2030. Land Rover projects their cars to be 60% BEV by that time. Ford announced that all their cars in Europe will be EV by 2026. This fuels a lot of hope for the EV sector. Every revolution and every war is about chaos. And that's what we're seeing. Advances are being made on both sides. It's hard to discern what the real turning point will be and when. You have people with differing views and projects. And the only common thing we share is just knowing the storm is brewing. Let's talk about how the oil and gas lobbyists are reacting. So the U.S. Senate passed a budget resolution in August for a $3.5 trillion budget reconciliation package. But then there's the American Petroleum Institute. And you also have the American Gas Association. They're two of the most powerful oil and gas lobbies in America. Since that budget resolution, API and AGA have been flooding Facebook with targeted ads that, are, that oppose climate initiatives. API alone sent $423,000 on Facebook ads. And these ads have been viewed some 21 million times. Their average ad spend is a bit shy of $11,000 a day, which of course is peanut money for them. AGA has been spending too. They spent $18,000 on Facebook ads with the goal of moving people to contact their members of Congress and vote no to higher energy costs and against the energy tax. Whatever the case and however things turn out, one thing is for sure as far as the car world is concerned, EVs first died out in the early 1900s. It re-emerged in the 1970s only to fade out again. America just wasn't ready for it 30 to 40 years ago, but then it re-entered mainstream America in the 21st century. And this time it's not going to fizz out and die again. This time it has a foothold and it's here to stay. Many people love the sound of a V8 engine. It conveys power and reliability. But car makers try to sell you a turbocharged inline four, saying it's comparable. Or if you want more, they offer you a hybrid. But if you think a turbo inline four and V8 are the same, you'd be duped. And if you want to blame the car maker, then you're wrong. It's the EPA. Imagine you're looking to buy a new car and your top priority is not performance, but fuel economy. After researching a few models, you decide on a car with a high published EPA rating. But after a month of use, 
and driving around town, you realize you're only getting a meager 24 miles per gallon on average. And you wonder, what happened to the promised 30 miles per gallon on highway and 28 miles per gallon combined? And you wouldn't be alone to wonder that. A lot of car and truck owners have complained about the gap between the fuel efficiency they thought they'd get and what they actually get on the road. This leads many to wonder where the promised fuel economy is and whether it's a deliberate deception. Before any car maker can put a model out on the market, it must first get approval from the EPA. Did you know that since the late 1970s, the EPA has certified fuel economy projections for some 450 million new cars sold in the U.S.? The fuel efficiency projections that you see on the window stickers of new cars and trucks are there by law. For example, you might see city miles per gallon 16 and highway miles per gallon 25. Of course, when you see those numbers, they're boldly displayed and appear very official. That's because they're coming from the federal government, which gives it a lot of credibility. After all, the EPA figures determine whether an automaker is meeting their required average fuel economy specifications for the company's entire vehicle line, so these numbers are very important. They're important for us as consumers as well, because fuel efficiency is high on the list of things that new car buyers want. So I think this is also a matter of trust. Guess how many employees work for the EPA and how many of them actually test cars? The common view is that the federal agency is working diligently to test every new truck, car, van, and SUV model. But in reality, for the most part, it doesn't conduct tests on its own. That's because it simply doesn't have the budget, equipment, or manpower to test hundreds of individual models, each with its own unique engine and transmission combinations. Surprisingly, only 18 of the EPA's 17,000 plus employees work in the automotive testing department, which is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. These 18 employees analyze roughly 200 to 250 vehicles a year and research about 15% of new models. As for the remaining 85%, the EPA allows each automaker to test their own vehicles and submit their test results. The agency takes the figures provided by each individual car company as factual without any further testing, and they approve the numbers that we end up with seeing on the window sticker. And that's why we see their stamp of approval in the words assessed by the EPA. This is one reason why my actual mileage may differ from what you see in advertisements in the window sticker. Is the automaker interested in making the reported miles per gallon different from the actual mileage? In a way, yes. When a car falls into the category of gas guzzler, that is below 22 and a half miles per gallon, or when a brand's entire lineup falls short of the government's fuel economy regulations, then someone has to pay literally. That's because it's the law. We can thank the Energy Act of 1978, which introduced what many call the gas guzzler tax. This tax is added to the sticker price, although it does not apply to trucks. So, for example, the smallest fine a new car buyer will pay for the low fuel economy of a particular car can be a thousand bucks. That's the line applied on a Mercedes-Benz S550 with its 14 miles per gallon city and 22 miles per gallon highway. The car with the worst fuel economy is a Lamborghini Murcielago that gets just eight miles a gallon city, 13 on the highway for a combined 10 miles per gallon. For this excess, the buyer pays a fine of $6,400, but the maximum penalty can go up to $7,700 for a car. So it's not surprising since 1983, nearly $800 million in fines have been collected by the IRS from new car buyers. Car makers also have to pay if the fuel economy figures don't meet the standards set by the corporate average fuel economy regulations. These regulations were also set in 1978 and apply to the entire vehicle fleet. Since the 2009 model year, it was officially agreed that automakers should meet an average of 27.5 miles per gallon for passenger cars and 23.1 miles per gallon for light trucks. Car fleets are divided into three categories, domestic cars, imported cars, and light trucks. And each individual category must meet the requirements for fuel economy. If any automaker fails to reach its mark, it'll be fined $5.50 times each 0.1 miles per gallon under the threshold times the number of cars sold. This is why, for example, Ferrari paid $616 bucks for each of its 1,645 vehicles sold in 2008, which amounted to over a million dollars a year in fines. So as you can see, manufacturers also have to pay too. Of course, to keep the industry honest, the EPA does spot checks each year. Remarkably, the agency says its own test results are almost always very close to those of the automakers. But what happens when the agency and the automaker's performance has differ? According to the rules, the EPA retests the vehicle to evaluate the performance of the automaker. Fuel economy should be within three percentage points. Otherwise, the automaker must accept the smaller of the two sets of numbers or request another retest. But there are other reasons that can explain the differences in 
and fuel economy estimates. The fact is that the real world, there are so many different variables that impact fuel economy like driving conditions, behaviors, and so forth. Absolute accurate miles per gallon simply is not possible. As a result, in 2008, the EPA updated its testing protocols, taking into account that real life driving has more stops, starts, accelerates, and decelerates, and tends to be more aggressive and faster on the highway and so on. So while there's a marginal difference, it does seem that EPA and real world average fuel economy figures are much closer than ever before. So how does the EPA testing lab work? The EPA system was modified in 1984 and also in 2008 to make it more relevant. Even though it still doesn't precisely reflect real world driving, the EPA continues to use dynamometer based stationary laboratory tests to ensure repeatability. You can think of the dynamometer or dyno as a giant treadmill for cars. The vehicle is held stationary while the wheels are turning large rollers on a chassis dynamometer. There are three such stands, one of which is an all wheel drive unit with sets of rollers for both front and rear wheels, while the other two dynos are rotated only by the drive wheels of the car, either front wheel or rear wheel. Once the vehicle is secured to the dyno, personnel enter values and figures to simulate real world factors such as wind and friction on the road. The EPA fuel economy test has certain parameters to follow. Then one of the EPA's six experienced drivers will get behind the wheel to drive the test car. The driver has to precisely follow a red line of speed against time which is displayed on a monitor hanging directly in front of the windshield. The driver does his best to match the red line with the car's wheel speed. Actually, it's much more difficult than you think. If the speed deviates from the test cycle by more than two miles an hour, the results don't get counted and you have to start over. There is a crazy high number of documents that explains each procedure and circumstance in detail, each with its own set of rules. Even the process of rounding off fuel economy test results that gets published on a new car sticker label is unbelievably complicated. But this is what the EPA does on their end to get the most accurate miles per gallon rating they can on a dynamometer. A key element of the EPA's estimated average fuel economy is the separation between city and highway driving. Almost all cars and trucks provide better fuel economy when driving at 55 miles on an open highway as opposed to stop and go traffic on city streets. When it comes to calculating the combined miles per gallon, the EPA assumes that motorists drive 55% of the time in the city and 45% of the time on the highway. That's the benchmark they use. But of course, in the real world, if you live in a large city, you'll likely spend more time in the city than 55%. Even if you spend a lot of time driving on a highway, it's only considered highway if your average speed is 50 miles per hour and up. Try doing that in rush hour traffic in Houston. It's impossible. If you had crawl on a traffic on the highway at a speed of 10 miles an hour, then your fuel consumption will be closer to city than highway. So if you're diligently keeping track of the number of miles you travel based on the agency's MPG rating, it'll be hard not to be disappointed. You can't simply add their numbers to your own driving habits. Honestly, assessing your particular situation is the only way to accept EPA rating differences or simply change your driving style to match it. Then your car's odometer will more accurately reflect the fuel economy. Now there are six factors that studies estimate could cause a car's actual fuel economy to differ significantly from the EPA rating. The first factor is the amount of city driving you do. Driving with frequent starts and stops can reduce the EPA combined by city and highway fuel efficiency by as much as 27%. Second, your driving style can reduce fuel efficiency by up to 18%. Studies show that calm drivers benefit from 35% better fuel economy than over aggressive drivers. A third factor that impacts fuel economy is the use of an air conditioner. Turning it on continuously results in a fuel efficiency reduction of up to 14% on older cars. Fourth, the size of your car also plays a role. It can reduce mileage by up to 15%. A fifth reason has to do with your region and climate. For example, environments with hot weather and mountainous conditions can reduce fuel efficiency by as much as 12%. And the last thing that can cause the real mileage to differ from EPA is if you're constantly carrying heavy loads or passengers. So take all that into mind before you jump to the conclusion that the EPA rating is completely off. By the way, another thing to consider is the type of fuel you're using which can affect the fuel economy. For example, the EPA conducts a test with 100% gasoline in the tank, but most U.S. gasoline contains 8 to 10% ethanol. This ethanol is used to increase the amount of oxygen in the gasoline and to provide better fuel combustion, but it alone can reduce fuel efficiency by about 2%, which might sound little, but when you couple that with some of the other factors, it can all add up. Now imagine that if you check box for two, maybe three, or even more of these six factors that reduce fuel economy. 
The next question probably is, why can't the agency take these nuances into account when testing cars? The short answer is that it's simply not possible. It's impossible to know what percentage of drivers in which terrain will have aggressive driving patterns in order to accurately calculate this figure. It's also not possible to calculate exactly where every particular vehicles are driven the most and how often the air conditioner is on and so on. Also, remember that most of the time, although automakers conduct their tests with the agency's test protocols, the final fuel efficiency figures are provided by the automakers makers themselves and not the EPA. When you're paying your premium, you might have that thought that maybe you can get by without car insurance. But when an accident happens, boy, are you glad you have it. So how can you protect yourself while minimizing your costs? One way to lower your car insurance premium is through discounts. For example, there's a multiple car discount. In general, if you have multiple cars and multiple drivers who are related by blood or by marriage and are living in the same residence, then you qualify for a multiple car discount. Let's say you're newly married. You and your spouse each have a car, but under separate company. But you might be able to lower your collective car insurance if you insure both cars under the same company as a married couple. Or let's say you have a teenage son. In that case, most likely you're already paying a bit more because premiums are generally higher for teens. But if your son's school grades are B or above, or he ranks in the top 20% of his class, then you should ask your insurance provider if they offer a good student discount. Many providers offer this for teens and young adults until they turn 25 years old. Companies reason that high schoolers and college students who are responsible are most likely to be responsible drivers and less likely to need an insurance claim. The discount can range anywhere between 1% up to even 39%, depending on the company. You'll need to provide some proof of eligibility. It all depends on the insurer, but typically it's an official school transcript or report card, or maybe SAT scores showing they're in the top 20% of the national average. On a similar note, did you know that your credit rating impacts your car insurance rate? Many folks are actually surprised to learn this. But the reasoning is similar to that behind the good student discount. Statistics show that a person with an excellent credit rating is usually someone who is responsible and mature in their personal life, and less likely to file an insurance claim. In other words, it means less risk for the insurance company. In fact, if your credit rating is poor, you may be paying 50% or more on your car insurance premium. So you might want to see how you can improve your credit rating to good or excellent. It'll take time to build up your credit, but it's worth it because it'll help you in other aspects of your life too. Another way to cut your car insurance costs is by qualifying for a multi-line discount. For example, you probably already have a homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance. So if you can get your car insurance and your homeowner's or renter's insurance to the same company, you'll see greater savings. For example, Allstate offers up to a 10% car insurance discount and 25% homeowners discount if you bundle them together under their company. Did you know that you can lower your car insurance premium by paying more attention on the road? Literally, most people know that traffic violations and accidents count against you and can raise your premium. But what many don't know is if you're an alert, defensive driver, this means less traffic violations and accidents on your record, which means you qualify for a good driver or safe driver discount. It can range between 10 to 23% depending on your driving history and record. Consider it a reward for safe driving. Also, did you know that the annual mileage you put on your car impacts your insurance premium? In general, it's good to ask your insurer how many miles they currently have you on record as driving. That's because they estimate this information, and if it's wrong by a large margin, that means you're paying more than you should. So it's good to check it and get that corrected if needed. Also, if you commute as you're driving two to three hours every day, your premium will be much higher than someone who commutes to work near their house. One way to reduce your premium is to ask your insurer about their mileage special. If the savings are significant and you're able to reduce your mileage by taking public transportation or the office van pool part of the time, that might be worth considering. So you may love your vehicle, but did you know that the type of car you have impacts your premium? Let's say you bought your large dream SUV. Unfortunately, insuring a 5,000 pound high-end car is more expensive than insuring a smaller, safer, less expensive commuter car. Also, if this commuter car is a hybrid or alternative fuel car, you can qualify for further discounts. So if you really need to cut your insurance premium and fuel costs, then consider downsizing to a hybrid commuter car, for example. Or if you're shopping for a car right now, then evaluate insurance costs before you buy. The year, make, and model has a big impact on your insurance rate. So it's worth getting the insurance estimate because it can help influence which car you choose from your shortlist. But let's say you have an older car. Well, you might want to consider nixing collision or comprehensive coverage. The reason is you might be paying more than your car is worth. And then if it gets totaled, you don't get much money back anyway. The general rule of thumb is to add your collision and comprehensive premium costs. Then multiply it by 10. Compare that value with how much your old car 
car is worth right now. If your car is worth less than that value, it might not be beneficial to get collision or comp. That's because the average policyholder makes an insurance claim just once every 11 years and reports a total loss once every 50 years. Another way to cut your insurance costs is to look at your deductible. The higher the deductible, the lower the premium. If you're the kind of person who likely won't file smaller claims anyway because, let's say, you don't want to risk pushing up your premium, for example, then it might make sense to raise the deductible on your policy and enjoy a lower premium. Going from a $250 deductible to $1,000 can mean saving between 25 and 40% on your policy. Then you can set aside those savings to use as your deductible and cover your costs in the event of an accident. If you already have homeowners or renters insurance, you already know that you can get discounts if you have certain anti-theft devices installed. Well, it's a similar thing when it comes to cars. Depending on the insurer, you might be able to get up to 25% off if you have an anti-theft system in your car. Each insurer has their own requirements on car alarms and low jacks. So you'll want to ask first before you get it installed. Some insurers also offer discounts on safety devices like motorized seat belts. Believe it or not, the neighborhood you live in impacts your insurance rate. That's because insurers go by the statistics in your local area. This includes type and frequency of crime, like car theft and vandalism, demographics of people, and even the type of cars in your locale. The algorithm analyzes all those data points to calculate the dollar risk and probability of car theft, car accidents, and so forth. Of course, most people won't be able to move to another area just to reduce their car insurance. But if you're already planning to move, it's something to consider. For example, urban neighborhoods have higher rates of accidents stuff some vandalism in rural areas and therefore higher car insurance premiums so maybe it's time to head for the hills also it is good to ask your insurer if they offer any other less commonly known discounts you might be surprised for example some insurers offer special discounts for military personnel veterans senior citizens teachers employees of certain companies and so forth it never hurts to ask the worst answer you can get is that there are none Another tip is to always keep your car insurance active. If you even have the briefest lapse in coverage, it can increase your premium. Also, paying your full premium up front is generally cheaper than paying monthly, which can be higher and can come with an administration. Then there's a the thing called black box car insurance. It's a newer user-based type of insurance. Basically, you put a tracking device on your car, which records your driving behavior and mileage. The insurer then tailors the premium based on how safe you drive and how much you drive. Big Brother is watching you. So if you're a safe, low mileage driver, this might give you a reduction in your premium. But if you're not as safe as you want to believe you are, it could work against you and lead to a higher premium. Let's talk briefly about how car insurance was even conceived. Would it surprise you to learn that Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the U.S., was one of the forefathers of insurance in the U.S.? That's right, the man who invented bifocals, experimented with electricity, and designed the lightning rod. Well, of course, cars went around back in his day, but in 1751, Benjamin had another bright idea. He formed the Philadelphia Contributorship, who was the first company in the colonies to offer fire insurance. In the first year, the organization issued 143 fire insurance insurance policies that lasted for seven years. Well, not one of those insured properties caught fire during that time, but it did blaze the way for the insurance industry of America, and it made a lot of money for old Ben. But it wasn't until 1897 in Dayton, Ohio, that the U.S. saw its first automotive insurance policy. It was issued by the Travelers Insurance Company to Gilbert J. Loomis for a hundred bucks. It protected him if his car killed or injured someone or damaged their property. By today's standard, the insurance plan was very basic. Pretty much, it is the earliest form of car liability insurance. In those days, car insurance was optional and rare. Safe driving wasn't something people cared about. In fact, anyone could operate a car, even if they had no idea what they were doing. It wasn't until 1903 that Massachusetts and Missouri became the first states to require drivers to have a driver's license. By 1930, 24 states required drivers to have a license. Yet only 15 of those licenses required a driving exam. It wasn't until 1959 that all states required drivers to be licensed and tested. The car insurance industry took much longer to become mainstream. Massachusetts was forward thinking. In 1927, it became the first state to require drivers to carry car liability insurance. But believe it or not, for 30 years until 1957, Massachusetts remained the only state to legally require drivers to have car insurance. Today, only two states don't require car insurance, and that's Virginia and New Hampshire. The latter isn't surprised. Go figure, since it is the live, free, or die state. Anyway, there's an organization called the National Association of Insured Commissioners. According to their statistics, car insurance premiums have been rising in the double digits up to 30% in recent years. According to AAA, the average annual premium for a new car is over 1200 bucks. 
So when it comes to car insurance, it doesn't hurt to shop for quotes every several years just in case a lower rate is now available elsewhere. And here's a caveat. Just don't go for the cheapest. You should consider the company's financial strength and credit worthiness. What's the point of paying the cheapest rate if it turns out the company won't be able to cover you later on or they delay processing your claim in a timely manner? But now you tell me, is there a car insurance brand you trust and why? If you have any funny or horror stories with dealing with a car insurance company, please comment below and share. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for your support.